Afternoon, everybody. If I keep this volume, are we going to be okay without me holding a microphone? At the back? No. I've seen a couple of shaking heads. We'll use the mic. I have a red light. That's working, isn't it? Right, yeah, good afternoon and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. It's great to see such a big turnout. Um, partly because it's only a few weeks since we started promoting this event, so to get so many people here at such short notice is fantastic. But I think secondly, when you, when you think about hosting an event to talk about pain, it, it's not an obvious crowd puller, is it? I know when I've had, conversation, <laughs> when I've had conversations with my wife, I mean, it's a bit different because she's a physio, so she kind of gets it, but certainly my family and friends, and they're asking what you're doing at work, and are you hosting an event? So what is it? It's, during the working day, it's, um, we don't pay people to come. They come along voluntary to, voluntarily to listen to people talk about pain, to learn about pain. Um, but I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir a little bit when I say that we acknowledge and we recognise the collective we that there is a, there's a huge problem with persistent pain. Um, there's a significant burden, there's a significant distress caused by it, and there's a significant impact both at an individual level, a community level, a population and society level. Um, so this event and the future events that we're running are all about trying to, trying to give people some understanding. And there's no shortage of appetite, it seems. And today's attendance, combined with the attendances we had at our events previously in Boston and in Grantham, just illustrate that point that there's no shortage of appetite of people wanting to learn more, wanting to look to, to try and understand if there's, if there's a better way forward. Um, so thanks again for coming and supporting, guys. Um, in terms of today's event, particularly privileged and excited to introduce um, probably two of the best people you could, you could have to come and discuss this subject matter with material with you. Um, so I'm going to be introducing Professor Laura Mosley, who joins us all the way from Adelaide via Zaragoza. Did we decide how we pronounce that, Laura? I don't think we did decide that. Zaragoza? <laughs> Zaragoza, <Spain. laughs> see. <laughs> and made it here despite some, some nervy moments with Storm Dennis and Heathrow Airport possibly being closed, etc. Uh, and Professor Cormac Ryan, not as quite as far afield, but from, I wrote this on the back of my hand, Cormac, Athlone in Ireland. That's right. Via Thirsk, a little bit more local, only across a couple of county borders. Um, both of these guys, fantastic speakers, hugely knowledgeable people, uh, and, and, and pretty damn humble as well. So I think it's probably better that I try and do a little bit of the intro to give you an insight as to how credible they are and how fortunate we are to have them here than to leave them to do it themselves, because they won't do themselves justice. Um, and I wasn't confident I'd do it justice without making a note or two. And I didn't know I'd be holding a mic, and I'd need a third hand as well. <laughs> there we go, ever resourceful. Um, so Lorimer started his journey from a football injury that left him with debilitating back and leg pain for over a decade. He became a physiotherapist and is now arguably one of the world's leading pain scientists and its most renowned pain educator. He's won prizes for his work in 13 countries, including Australia's most prestigious prize for medical research. He's written 350 research articles and five books, including the two highest selling pain books worldwide. He's been treating people in pain for 25 years and of his many, many different roles. Um, he includes working with the International Olympic Committee and Arsenal Football Club, which I don't even hold against him as a Man United fan, <laughs> particularly when they're doing so badly. Uh, and Cormac, uh, almost equally impressive, I'd say Cormac's uh, Professor of Clinical Rehabilitation at Teesside University, started his clinical career as a physio working in Glasgow, uh, has been researching in the field of pain and pain education for 15 or so years. He's co-editor of Pain and Rehab Rehabilitation, the journey of the Physiotherapy Pain Association. He's currently part of a team revising the British Pain Society Pain Management Programme Guidelines and is co-author of a physiotherapy chapter within the Faculty of Pain Medicine core standards. Uh, I think we could probably go on and on in terms of a CV, but just suffice to know you're in good hands and you're hearing this from, in some cases, the horse's mouth when it comes to some of the research. Um, in terms of today, um, I know you're not here to listen to me speak, so I'm going to try and wrap this up quickly and hand over. Um, today's event we're calling a public... I'm really not doing a good job of this bit, am I? <laughs> This is, as I mentioned before, this is the third in our series of community engagement events, which form part of our campaign, which we're launching from a new brand perspective today, of Flipping Pain. The event today is entitled Pain, Do You Get It? 
and hopefully that title will become clear as the guys work their way through the presentation. Um, as well as the pain do you get it and the flipping pain brands, phrases that you may have seen over some of the material, posters, etc., depending on where you heard about today's event, um, you'll hear about pain revolution as well. Lauren will talk more about that, but pain revolution is the, is the initiative, the movement that we are essentially mirroring and replicating with Lorimer's support here in the UK that's been up and running for a, a couple of years now in Australia. Third year? Fourth year? Fourth year. These are the guys I just mentioned to you before. The last little bit before I hand over, from a housekeeping perspective, hopefully you had them pointed out on your way in, but through that door there, there's access to toilets. We're not expecting any fire drills or alarms. So if we do have one, it's the real deal. We can exit this door, this one here. Uh, that one's probably a little bit less accessible. And the, and the congregation point is in the car park behind this building. Um, and I suppose the very last thing is just being mindful of and respectful of our audience here and the fact that uh, we're filming. Can I just ask you to do a double belt and braces check that phones are either turned off or on silent. And if you do need to leave for any particular reason, toilets, etc., um, just try and do so as smoothly and quietly as possible. So, nothing else for me other than to pass over to Lorimer, I believe, first, to kick us off. Cool. Thanks. I'll have a crack at that. Great. Thanks, Richard. Wow, look how full this room is. That's fantastic. Can you hear me without the microphone? I would love to not use the microphone if that's possible. But if, if, I, if I start to mumble because I am Australian, uh, someone put up your hand and say, you're mumbling. And I will respond and I will grab that. But where I come from, it's a custom to uh, pay respect to the local people. Uh, and uh, I live in Adelaide in South Australia uh, on the land of the Ghana people who have been uh, meeting like this for 65,000 years. And I ride through these big gum trees every morning on my way to work and back. And it is, is with, with great gratitude that I bring you greetings from where I live. Uh, and I thank you for having me in your, on your land. Uh, Lincolnshire, the, the Lincoln, the home of the Magna Carta. But more importantly, the home of the plum cake. <laughs> is that right? Or is it the plum bread or something? Uh, we were discussing which had changed the world more and it was a no-brainer that it's the plum cake that had done that. Uh, I also am taking this opportunity in, in my time in Europe to thank, uh, thank you from our, our country. We have been overwhelmed by the support that we have received uh, to do with our bushfires, which were terrible. Uh, but there are people here I know who were motivated to help us on the other side of the earth uh, in, what, in what has been a, a really challenging time for us. So I thank you for that. I want to tell you also uh, a bit about, maybe not about me, but uh, as Richard has said, I am a recovered person in pain. Uh, I am a pain scientist, I'm a pain educator, I'm a physiotherapist. Uh, I am painfully bad at cricket. Uh, but we, cricket's not very popular in Australia. We don't have many people who play cricket. <laughs> This is a bit small for some of you, but I, I want you to look at this drawing. We asked uh, an artist to speak with people who were experiencing persistent pain and to ask them what it's like trying to negotiate their way through the healthcare system. And I want you to have a look and see, are you, are you recognising this? this nightmare of choice. These people with the cure, these quick fixes or you need me approaches. And if you didn't relate to this, if you thought there's no nightmare, I know the choice, then you would not be here. If you are a health professional, 
I hope you can dig deep and see yourself in here because as health professionals, we have done a great disservice to people in pain for 30 to 40 years. We often think about the problem of opioids, unnecessary surgery, premature knee replacements. You know, there's a place in the USA, it's in California, where the biggest predictor of whether or not you will get a knee replacement is not whether or not you have knee pain. It's how close you live to a surgeon who replaces knees. Just think about that, how badly wrong that system is. I want to suggest to you that uh, there are many misconceptions about our understanding of pain and what to do about it, that there is another way that's scientifically based, and it's not new. We've known in some circles in the pain science world for some time, and we are now convinced that a massive public health problem like persistent pain requires a massive public health campaign to flip how it's managed. So it's, it, it's so exciting for me to be here. I w I'm paid to be here by this campaign, I, uh, who has contributed to my airfare from Australia. And I slept up the front, <laughs> which is fantastic. If you ever get a chance to try that, it's amazing. So clearly, I, it, it, I, it's, it's in my interest to be here from that perspective. But I'm so excited about any attempt to change public understanding of pain to match the science. And that's what we're going to try and do today. What is the problem? Well, about 30 to 50% of people, and certainly in Lincolnshire, these numbers uh, are high, their life is compromised by persistent pain. That's many of you. Your life is not as good as you would like it to be because of persistent pain. Public understanding is riddled with misconceptions Healthcare is often a long way behind the scientific understanding. We need a reset. And one of the real problems that we face across the world is that there are a lot of people making a lot of money out of not solving the chronic pain problem. So we need you to be driving change. We need you to be driving change. In Australia, we set up this thing called the pain revolution. And it was called that because it was first conceptualized around a rural bicycle ride, where we would ride from town to town, a group of pain scientists running seminars like this, outreach events like this. And we wanted the revolution idea because it's a truly revolutionary message, but we were riding bikes. So we wanted that part of it. It's a grassroots movement, it's not for profit. It's emphasizing giving control to people in pain. And once you have understanding, you, you are a step, a significant step closer to control of your situation. And we do that by emphasizing the latest knowledge, proven skills and ways of managing. Now, many of you will already be recognizing phrases and be thinking, ah, I've, I know this, I've heard this before. And if that's you, I just want to say to you, hang on, hang on, because you have the power, but you have to learn it. You're going to have to learn it. No one's going to be able to just give you this power. So I want you to think about what's, what's your story? And the research tells us that most people with persistent pain uh, recognize one of three stories. The first story is that they are, are still searching for the cure of their particular pain problem. They're looking for the magic bullet, the magic pill, the guru who knows something different. Another common one is that they are trying to beat it. They are saying, I'm not going to let this pain get me down. I'm going to ignore it. 
I'm going to beat it. And the third common way is I'm out. I've tried everything. I'm resigning myself to not being able to get out of this mess. Now, many of you will relate to one of these stories. And you are not alone. There are millions of humans who relate to one of these stories. And the problem that we face is that with each story, things are not improving. Things are not improving or things are getting worse. Do you relate to that reality? I was probably on each of these stories in my late teens, early 20s. And we could broadly say there's, there's two main pathways, the no pain, no gain pathway, where you try to beat it, but you're slowly losing over time. You're disconnecting from your social engagements. You're finding it harder to work or to look after the kids or in fact to go to school. And you keep trying to beat it. <coughs> or there's the let pain be your guide road. And then you gradually avoid more and more activities because they're painful. And you very sensibly think that pain equals tissue damage. That is the most common misconception about pain. I want to say that again because I hope that's, that some of you think, what? I hope you get a, whoa. The idea that pain equals tissue damage is the most common misconception about pain. It feels like it, doesn't it? It feels like it. But hopefully after today, you might think, maybe there's more to this story. The new possibility. Unfortunately, the best evidence we've got says there is no quick fix for persistent pain. The journey to recovery actually will not be easy. And we're very, very privileged to have people among us who have taken that journey. But, it gets easier the longer you stick at it. We know that. It gets easier. The hardest week on a new journey is the first week. It's not quick, but it will be quicker than many people might expect it to be. We've spent the last 15 years researching what are the, what are the most important things for people to understand and do if they hope to recover from a persistent pain problem. I'm just going to flash them on the screen. I don't expect you to take them home, but it's really just to give you an idea of the sorts of messages that modern science wants people in pain to understand. This is too small for the people up the back. So close your eyes and listen to the dulcet tones of an Australian. <laughs> I could, shall I do it to music? <laughs> Once a jolly segment. The first one is pain is always real. Do not let anyone, a health professional, a doctor, a friend in the pub, a footy mate, tell you your pain is not real because it's not explained by an injury or because you have a CAT scan that says you're a pretty normal 55-year-old. This has nothing to do with whether or not pain is real. All pain, if you feel it, it's real. It's pain. Learn more about your pain. We now know, experts around the world agree, the most important first intervention is learning about your pain. And that's hard. But you can do it. Pain does not equal tissue damage. Pain actually equals protection. Pain is protecting you from tissue damage. And that's the first flip. Pain is not a measure of tissue damage. It never is, even in mice in cages. Pain is a measure of how much you are protecting the tissues of your body. Pain depends on context. Anyone ever watched a football game, soccer, football? Ever watched one? 
Raise your hand if you've ever seen a football game. Thank goodness. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when uh, someone scores in a football game, 10 big people run at them and jump on top of them? And then 30 seconds later, the person who scored gets up, shakes themselves off and keeps playing. Just imagine if that exact same scenario happened while walking through the park on a dark evening. And we know that that individual who's just had 10 people jump on top of them is at very high risk of never recovering from pain. Just think of those two scenarios. The load on the body is very similar, but the context, totally different. The brain is smart enough to know this situation is not worth protecting. This situation is life-threatening. Don't let it happen. Pain in your protector meter. That's a, a, the idea that inside you, you have a protector meter that is, is gauging the world. It's a good thing to learn. Your pain system can become overprotective. We know that can happen. You can retrain your pain system to be less protective again with recognised skills, strategies on the basis of understanding. And you need to be proactive about this, not reactive. A lot of research identifies that these nine things will change your life, but none of them are easy. We're not going to talk about all of them. These are the uh, six things that the Flipping Pain campaign is grabbing out of those nine, and I'm going to walk you through a few of them. Before I do, I want to tell you about a fellow I went to school with. In primary school, a new fellow arrived at our school and he looked a bit odd. And he spoke with a bit of an unusual voice and he immediately was the target of bullying until he showed us his trick. And it was a remarkable trick. He would uh, charge you $5 for the privilege of jumping on his hand. He would allow you for $10 to jump from on top of a little wall onto his hand. Now I was in year five at school and I saved up my $10 <laughs> because I thought I'm going to do this. And I said to him, Jason, here's my $10. And Jason willingly took my money with not any evidence of nervousness, put his hand on the bitumen, is that what you call it here? The, and I got on the wall and I jumped up in the air and I landed on his hand and it was horrible. I felt his hand break under the force of my feet. And he did not flinch. His hand started to swell up. I felt sick. Even now remembering it, I feel a bit sick. I went home and my mum, who greeted me every day from school with the same words, how was your day today, love? Was enough for me to lose it. Totally lost it. I broke Jason's hand. You what? I broke his hand. How did you do that? I paid $10 to jump <laughs> off a wall. Jason was only at the school. He, he was taken from school. I was in trouble with the headmaster. Uh, he didn't come to school again for a couple of weeks and returned with his hand in a cast. He left our school about six months later and I, I found out maybe two years later that Jason had died. And the cause of his death was that his, his system, his body was born without danger detectors. So his brain had not learnt how to produce pain. So he was not protected. And he had internal injuries that killed him without a symptom. 
Jason had no ability to produce pain. So he was totally unprotected. Let's go to the other end of the system where you have a system very capable of producing pain and you become overprotected. Pain is a protective experience that is a life-saving experience. The challenge that we have is that 30% of people are having pain that is no longer serving that protective function. The purpose of pain is protection or in flipping pain's words, hurt does not equal harm. Here's a fun scientific fact for you. One of our experiments clearly shows that violinists, I'm now imitating a violinist, are more sensitive on the fingers of their left hand than they are on the fingers of their right hand. Yeah, nice facial expression. Why is this so? We think it's because violinists have to protect their left hand or they can't play the violin. Their right hand they can still make do with missing two or three fingers actually. There's more reason to protect your left hand than there is in your right hand for a violinist. So the left hands are more sensitive. It's not about the hand. Does that make sense? It's not about the hand. It's about risk. Pain is about perceived risk. Raise your hand if you have ever in your life twisted your ankle. I think it's the most common injury. <coughs> You'll remember that it might have been swollen for a few days or maybe a couple of weeks, was sort of walk on, but maybe three or four weeks later, you're walking pain free. There's no way that, that, that ankle has healed, if it was a bad injury, in three or four weeks. But your brain is no longer protecting your ankle from walking. Pain is all about protection. It's not about telling you the condition of your ankle. It's about changing your behavior so that your ankle doesn't get injured again while it's healing. Here's an experiment, and we could do this experiment if we had enough time here. But in our laboratory, you could come in and have your finger put in a finger squeezer. <laughs> you put it in and we tighten it up to us. Uh, actually, you tighten it up until you're experiencing pain of, let's say, three out of 10. Then we take it off, you have a rest and you put your finger in again. And now your friend turns it up. And most people will say, hey, 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 no, you can't do it any tighter. But they can only tighten it to the same amount of squeeze. The same amount of squeeze hurts more if someone else is in control of the finger squeezer. To really show the effect, we get the PhD student to come in with a lab coat. Same pressure, more pain. It's not about the finger. It's about the risk. So pain is being produced to protect you. And the amount of protection will match the brain's evaluation of risk. Raise your hand if you've ever had back pain. Well done, you and 96% of the human race. Many back pains that are brutally painful, terrifyingly painful, the best machinery we've got cannot find an injury. Doesn't mean there's not one there, but it certainly means there's not a big one. Other back pains that feel exactly the same have an injury. But now for the really, really important confronting uh, fact. To have a pain-free injury, pain-free injury, it's got to be a life-threatening event. Think through that. Think through that. That when you're, you have an injury that is life-threatening, it's likely to not be at all painful. 
it's not about the body part, it's about the evaluation of risk. If your life is at, th at threat, why protect your shoulder joint? Protect your livelihood. Raise your hand if you ever heard of the story in the US of the man who cut off his own hand, rock climbing. A few of you. A remarkable story. And when he first described it, there was pain. He said, no, it didn't hurt. He cut off his own hand with a leather man pocket knife. Life-threatening situation. Why produce pain? Because pain is trying to protect you. It provides a protective buffer, if you like. Now, the pain system learns, like everything else in our biology, the more it runs, the better it gets at running. We get into this sort of situation. We get pain when we are actually not in danger. So like it or not, if you've had pain for years, you are having pain when your body is not in danger. Now, you, you may also have situations when your body is in danger, but your pain is not a good measure of that because the system learns. The painful body part actually becomes overprotected. How do you know this is happening? Well, in a normal pain system, the amount of movement or activity you can do that's pain-free might be this much. Once upon a time, for some of you, and now it's this much. Or the amount of time you can sit still in the seat or lie still in a bed or stand still might used to have been that much and now it's this much. These are signs of an overprotective pain system. The story gets more intuitive. In a normal system where a particular event, let's say bending over, picking up a box, going for a two kilometre walk, causes this much pain, in an overprotective system, the same event causes this much pain. Do you relate to these things? Are you seeing this in your own journey? Yeah, I've moved. What about this? In a normal pain system, loud noises don't hurt. They might hurt your ears. They don't hurt your shoulder or your back. In an overprotective pain system, they can. In a normal system, being stressed does not give you pain. In an overprotective pain system, it can. Just being stressed causes pain. This is where Mr. Magic, he doesn't like me calling him Mr. Magic, <laughs> Cormac does some really nice stuff to get across some of these tough concepts in a way that you engage it. Remembering you have to learn this. To change your journey, you've got to learn. It's hard to learn. Cormac's gonna run a little exercise. Sorry, I became too Australian just then. Cormac is going to run, <laughs> not gonna, going to run a little exercise related to this. Do you want that? I hang on to it. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Professor Cormac Ryan. Thanks, Lorimer. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as it's great to be here. I'm going to follow on from what Lorimer's just done there, talking about how our alarm system learns. And I'm going to do that by telling you a story that I tell my patients, OK? Imagine you've got a brand new car, and you love this car. It's the pride and joy. You've saved up. You've finally gotten it. You drive up to work so everyone can see it, you park, you go to work, you pop up your stairs, you almost kill yourself because you're so excited <laughs> about your car. You pull up your slacks and you start typing. Typing away, meanwhile, outside, a thief, possibly an Australian, <laughs> looks through the bushes, goes, ah, excellent. 
new car, new car radio. I'm going to get that. Runs over, smashes the car window, grabs the car radio, and runs off down the road. Two or three minutes later, car alarm goes off. You jump up, look out your window. I have no idea why your window is so high. It just is. You shout, oi! But he's gone. He's way, way gone. He's knocking over cutlery as he's gone. He's, he's out of it. OK? And you're like, OK, so you get up. You run down your four flights of stairs. Down this. You call the AA. You call the police. They come. Police take your statement. The AA, they replace your car window, put in a new car radio. And then the AA guy goes, I've got a little secret for you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up the sensitivity on your car alarm. No extra charge, I'm just going to do it for you. Next time that burglar comes, he's going to get a rude awakening. You say, oh, thanks very much, brilliant. OK, so they leave, bye bye. You head back up, making sure to give an extra jump on that <laughs> slightly bigger step. You pull up your slacks, you start typing. Outside, same guy, observing it all, goes, wonderful. I'm going to have that one too. Runs over. As soon as he hits the window, bang, car alarm goes off. He gets spooked. You jump up, look out your tall window, go, oi. He's, he's, he's rumbled, and he runs away. And you're like, oh, no. You go down your stairs carefully. And when you reach your car, your car is in pristine condition. It's perfect. And you're like, fantastic. I could kiss that AA guy. My car is perfectly safe. There's not a scratch on it. So you turn off the car alarm, but you leave the sensitivity right up. You need that sensitivity because it is protecting your car. And it's doing a wonderful job at protecting your car. Then you go back to work. Jump up, you pull up your slacks, you start typing away. Five minutes later, car alarm goes off. You go, what? You look up, and just outside, this couple have simply walked past your car and just brushed off it. It's the slightest of brushes. But that was enough to set the car alarm off. And it sounds just like it did when the thief smashed the window. You have to go all the way back down. Down your head. You have to turn off the car, the car alarm, but you leave the sensitivity right up because you need that to protect your tissues. You need that. You see where I'm going. You need that to protect the car. But you go back up your stairs. You jump up. You start typing away. Car alarm goes off. You look up, and there's a pigeon sitting on your car. Now he's obviously perhaps a little hard of hearing because he hasn't flown away, but he's sitting there quite content. You go down your four flights of stairs, you shoo him away, and you turn off the car alarm. But you leave the sensitivity right up because you need that sensitivity to protect your car. You go back up your four flights of stairs. You sit down at your computer and you start typing. And the car alarm goes off, and you look out, and it's again. The problem is no longer your broken window. The problem is no longer your stolen car radio. Your problem is now this overly sensitized, overly protective alarm system. And while it is keeping your car wonderfully safe, it is stopping you from doing so much of your usual daily activities and causing you so much trouble and strife. Hopefully, you will have perhaps seen how this story might relate to um, your chronic pain story. Pain is a marker of perceived threat or danger. Chronic pain is not so much due to tissue damaged, but a sensitized alarm system. And it does a wonderful job at keeping your tissues safe, but it does that to the detriment of all the other things you would love to be doing. But it 
gets in your way of doing. I'm going to stay with the alarm idea just for a moment. Okay? Um, I'm going to come up with two different scenarios around an uh, alarm to get you up in the morning. Okay? So let's say you're setting the alarm for a weekend morning. It's regular weekend morning. Your brother's coming around to pick up a hammer. You kind of like to be up before he arrives, but you know, if you're not, okay, you open the door in your pants, but you know, so be it. It's not a major issue. The next day, however, you've got an early morning flight. It's long distance, really expensive. You're going to a wedding. It's your wedding. <laughs> you really need to be there. How might you set the alarm differently on those two days? Any suggestions? Just from your own personal experience, early morning flights, how you might set your alarm differently. Really Pardon? Really early. really early. Awesome. That's one of the top, top answers. It's a bit like family fortunes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, absolutely. So setting it really, really early. And there are many reasons why you might set it really, really early, but it's to give yourself time just in case something happens, like you get stuck behind a tractor on the way to the airport or something like that. Brilliant. What other strategy might have people, do people use? Stay awake, all night. Stay awake all night. Sometimes there's no point in setting the alarm because you're so concerned and so worried about missing the flight that you, you can't sleep. So no sleep and anxiety. Does that ring bells with anyone? Any other strategies you might use? Set it louder. Awesome idea. If, it, it, you know, if it's on low enough, we've all rolled over and just gone, eh, bleh, bleh. but if it's super loud, then you're really going to do something about it. More than one. Another really, really popular idea. Uh, and, and, and some people put them not just beside them, but over the other side of the room. Does anyone do that? This is a way to make sure are absolutely going to create an action. You're going to have to do something in response to this alarm. These are all wonderful, wonderful strategies that we've all learned to do because the consequence of missing that plane is so big, we want to minimize the risk of missing that plane. And so we soup up our alarm to the top to make sure that that consequence or, or doesn't happen or to minimize the risk of it happening. Again, hopefully you guys can see this in your own lives, in your own sort of persistent pain story. The idea behind a ramped up sensitized alarm system, which is brilliant because it stops you from injuring yourself but it stops you also from doing so many other things. Imagine a life where you weren't just being woken by an alarm like that for a special morning. You were woken by an alarm by that every morning. And it wasn't just the morning. It was pretty much every event you had to do throughout the day. You were being followed by alarm clocks. They were everywhere, going off. How would you concentrate on the day? How would you uh, 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 um, do so many of the things you need to do? But one thing you wouldn't do would be miss your plane. Because it's brilliant at stopping you missing the plane. Just like chronic pain or persistent pain is brilliant at protecting your tissues. But the flip side, the downside, is that it stops you or makes it harder for you to do so many other things. But that's what this flipping pain campaign is all about helping you to understand your pain better helping you to understand how your alarm system learns is the first step to helping that system to to unlearn i'm going to hand over back to larmer you go. mind yourself on that step <laughs> thanks cormac what a great storyteller this Irish man is. <laughs> Outstanding. That was 
That was great. Uh, just for the record, at least eight out of ten Australians have never stolen a radio out of a new car. <laughs> the third thing I want to get across is that everything matters when it comes to pain, which is exactly one of the slogans for this Flipping Pain campaign. The harsh reality is that particularly when your system is overly protective, anything that suggests you're in more danger will increase your pain and anything that suggests you're in less danger will decrease your pain. And when I say anything, I mean anything. It doesn't have to be data coming from your body. It doesn't have to be sensory input. It can come from a range of things. For example, here's an experiment we did in our laboratory where supposedly normal people volunteered. Now, we have to say these are not normal people because they're volunteering for pain experiments. Just remember that. But we put a very cold stimulus on their hand under two different conditions. One was where they see a red light, which has a lot of meaning to it. And one was when they see a blue light, which also has a lot of meaning, but it's different meaning. And then we asked them, how much did that exactly the same stimulus hurt? And what this tells you, if you're not used to looking at figures like this, this each line represents an individual person. And hopefully you can see that most people, when they get this stimulus with a red light, it hurts more than if they get it with a blue light. For some people, like this person here, one out of 10 pain with a blue light and then exactly the same stimulus on their hand causes seven out of 10 pain when there's a red light because their brain is using that information to decide about risk, whether to protect. You might also see there's people like this person here that person is scientifically an idiot. <laughs> because their brain is not using that important cue. <laughs> then we take people uh, through this process of what might be affecting my pain. What things might be telling my brain things are more dangerous? And we think about Things you hear, see, smell, taste and touch. Have you ever been driving along the freeway just a few miles per hour over the limit and you hear sirens <laughs> and you feel your blood pressure rise and your heart rate and you go down to about half the speed limit? Because you, you, your brain's interpreting that data. I once uh, was travelling from... St. Petersburg to Dublin and British Airways lost my luggage and I made 113 phone calls trying to retrieve my luggage and every phone call I got the British Airways hold music which was that remember that? When I hear that, I get angry. <laughs> I feel a response to that. Now, in their favour, British Airways compensated the beautiful Anna and I, beautiful Anna is who, with whom I share my life, and I free air tickets to anywhere on the British Airways network. I just wish their hold music would give me that feeling of Portugal, where we went with our tickets, not this feeling of anger. Sensory data tap into the brain's evaluation of risk. When it comes to pain, have you ever heard these phrases? Someone with knee pain, has any, anyone ever said, oh, it's wear and tear? That's a danger message, it's wear and tear. You know it's not wear and tear? Actually, osteoarthritis is a complex inflammatory problem and what we see on x-rays is more adaptation to load, change in structure. Have you ever said this about someone? Ah, oh, that's your bad back. 
my, my, my back stuffed. I've got a slipped disc. You know, discs are totally unslippable. <laughs> but we talk about them as though I could line someone up the back. The, the gentleman second from the back with a haircut much like mine. We talk about discs as though I could lift up my shirt, peel off my muscles and <clears throat> shoot him <laughs> in the middle of the forehead with my disc as though it can slip out. We say this because of what it looks like on on scans. Now to us, we know it hasn't slipped, but to many consumers, many people in the general community, you think it has actually slipped. This is danger. So this, even this phrase, will just increase protection a bit. The smell of a hospital or the smell of burning rubber, we relate to the impact of these things on, on what we're feeling. Things you do, you reduce activity. The body and brain need activity. The body needs mechanical loading to be healthy. Persistent pain reduces the chances of doing that. We sleep more during the day and less during the night. Do you relate to that? Hard to get to sleep at night, hard to stay awake during the day. You spend more time alone because you're starting to think, I'm not as good company. And your friends have stopped asking you about this. And some of your friends have even said, you should just get on with it. That's dangerous. That's a dangerous piece of data, isn't it? A good brain should say, hey, I'm protecting this body here. You start searching for the guru with the cure. You take more pills and injections or surgeries. Things you do, sending danger messages to your brain. Things you say, my back is stuffed. I just have to live with it. I'm running out of options. No one can fix it. I'm the exception. Plenty of people have come up to me after a session like this and have said, good, good information. It's not really applicable to me. <laughs> and I will always say, oh, is that because you are not a human? <laughs> because this is applicable to humans. And that can be a really tough reality. And if you're feeling dissonance, if you're feeling uncomfortable with that now, I say, hang on to that, watch that discomfort and ask yourself, why is that making me uncomfortable? Because that's the first stage of learning. Your brain is picking up, something has to change. Things you think and believe, sorry about the, the font colour, which is disappointing because this is the most powerful influence over pain. The things you think and believe about your body, its resilience, its structural integrity, and what it needs. Places you go. I've seen people who recover from 25 years of neck pain until they go to the intersection where they had their accident. We have a phrase in some of the work that we do uh, to do with people in your life, which is, excuse my language here, ditch the dickheads. <laughs> because people in your life, some people in your life can be giving you danger, threatening. Other people in your life can give you safety and that affects your pain. Unless you are not a human and then it probably doesn't. Things happening in your body, you eat a lot of high calorie dense food which is inflammatory and inflammation makes pain worse. These sorts of things, there's many things, everything matters. Cormac, right. what can you tell us about everything matters when it comes to pain? Here we go. <laughs> Do you want that? Thank you. Um, no, not right now. Oh, actually, let's pop it on one. Thanks, Arm. Okay, right. Props. Bear with me while I hand out props. Do oh, good man. Do Can you pass one to Ellen? Ellen's, I don't know Ellen's name. She's in the middle there, lady with the white hair and the scarf. She's waving to you. Yeah, make sure you have one for Ellen. Now you wish I hadn't sat down and chatted to you before we started, Ellen. Okay, uh, right. Let's talk a little bit about everything matters, following on from what Larimer said. Um, 
Sometimes it's hard to um, take this idea of everything matters, that all these things can influence your pain experience because they're not necessarily happening right in front of your eyes right now. So to try and get this message ac across, I'm going to use a visual illusion. We're going to, instead of looking at how the pain system works for a minute, we're going to look at how vision works. Okay? So here's a quick picture of how vision might work. So light reflects off images in the surrounding area, comes in through the lens of your eye, onto the retina at the back, the uh, um, rods and cones, which are little sensors in the backs of your eye, convert the light energy into electrical energy, and then send that message via the optic nerve up to your brain, and that is what we see. So in other words, what is out there is neatly reflected by what you see. Is that a fair description? Yeah? A yeah. couple of nods? Okay. That's not completely the case. There's a little bit more to it than that. And we're going to use this prop to a kind of demonstrate that. Okay. Not all of you are going to be able to see this, but we'll ask people to pass it around. If we look here, Ellen, when you look at these, when you flip up your piece of paper and you look at this cube, I'll come down to you, Ellen, just for a second. Wonderful. <laughs> what color would you say that middle square is? The middle square. Yes, this one here. Brown. And what color would you say that square is? Orange. Orange. Would you say they're the same color? They probably are. They probably are. But would you say they're the same color? <laughs> no. Can you now flip over the piece of paper so as it just reveals the two squares? What color are those two squares now? Brown. If you pass it around, you'll see people very quickly trying to trick their eyes, going, does it really change color? And you'll find that it does. This is not magic. This is just simply the way we are wired. So in this situation, where light is reflecting off this cube into the lens of our eye, onto the retina, stimulating rods and cones that send the information via the optic nerve into the brain. There's a little man in our brain. And he is responsible for vision. And all around him are lots of pieces of jigsaw. And he uses that light information that comes in to make a real-time jigsaw of what he perceives to be out there. But he doesn't just use the light information coming in. He uses his previous experiences, his beliefs, his attitudes, all of these things, everything matters, to decide what you should see. Don't think of vision as an input to the brain. Light is an input to the brain. Vision is an output of your subconscious brain. It is produced in real time, so it is your subconscious brain's interpretation of what is going on there, or its prediction of what is there. Now, if we look at this illusion, and we look at it in in full, you'll see that there's a little bit of shading this side of the square. So when the subconscious man gets that information in, the, the, he takes into account the importance of that shading. The same amount of light energy is reflecting off both of those two squares that look different. But the same amount of light energy is reflecting off them. And it's because they're both the same color in reality. So when that little man gets these two pieces of information. He gets the fact that the same amount of light intensity from both those squares, but one of them is in shading. He makes the assumption or the prediction that the one in shading is brighter. 
So he makes the assumption that it is orange. And so in Ellen's case, and in everyone else's case, that is the image that little man creates with the real-time jigsaw. He does it instantaneously without any conscious control. <coughs> then, when we take away the context, when we put this sheet over and just cut out enough holes for those two squares, the little man has a much easier jigsaw puzzle to make because he doesn't have to take into account the effect of the shading. So it's gone from a thousand piece jigsaw of the sea to a four piece jigsaw of a cow. Much, much easier. And so he's able to give you a more accurate representation of what is actually there. But here's the really interesting bit. Even though I now consciously fully know that these are both brown, when I do that, it's back to being orange. I can't control it. I can't say, oh, I, know, I know it's brown. I'll, I'll see brown. The little man really doesn't care what I think. He's working on an algorithm, a set of assumptions, and he, based upon that, he predicts what you see and that is what you see. Vision is a production of our subconscious brain. It is an output. It is a prediction of what is there. And everything influences what our subconscious brains decide to show you. In the same way, persistent pain is a production of our bodies and our subconscious brain. And the little man who makes the jigsaw of pain, based upon everything, not just messages from the body, but previous experiences, expectations, beliefs, what he's been told, what he hears, what you say, where you go, all of these things influence the little man who makes the pain jigsaw. And if he perceives that you need protection, he will make the pain jigsaw. If he thinks you need lots of protection, he'll make a super big pain jigsaw. But if he perceives that you need less protect protection, he can begin to unpick the pain jigsaw. Doesn't happen overnight but it's the first step towards unpicking it. This illusion is being passed around. Take a look. It, it's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, um, uh, thank you. Great stuff. Thanks, Cormac. Uh, many of you, and around about 50% of the human population, probably have a little woman <laughs> making the jigsaw. Will that be right? Well, it's a, I would consider pain a nuisance, and thus I've always <laughs> left him as a man. Great stuff. <clears throat> Third thing I'd like to focus on is this game changer. Recovery is possible. And I want to talk you through, this is the only really scientific data that I'd like to present, and it's difficult, but I want you to try and understand what this shows and what it does not show. So, this is the average amount of pain over the last two days for a group of 1,400 patients with an average duration of pain of six years. So it's five out of 10 or 50 out of 100. The diagnoses they had included these diagnoses, back pain, herniated disc, spinal fusion, arthritis, fibromyalgia, neck pain, whiplash, pelvic pain, endometriosis, headaches, chronic fatigue. They are all in that group of people. Now, many of you will be in that group of people or somewhere thereabouts. 1,400 people. This is what happened to the answer to the question, average pain over the last two days 
for the portion of those people who flip their understanding of pain. None of them do it like that. All of them require effort. Sometimes a good coach, usually just really good access to really good resources. Nice books or good videos online. Slowly over the next year, this is what we in the pain field call a great outcome. An almost miraculous outcome. But only half the people we've seen in this group do this. The other half don't change. They haven't flipped their understanding. And what is critical here is that all of them participated in very similar interventions. So I'm not showing you an effective intervention. I'm showing you the power of learning. I'm going to say that again. I'm not showing you an effective intervention. I'm showing you the power of learning about your pain and changing your journey. It won't be easy to do that, but it will get easier the longer you do that. So the, the key takeaway message is, I'm sorry for the light here, but this says persistent pain is common and can affect anyone. Hurt does not mean harm. Having pain does not mean you are damaging tissue. In fact, even in mice in a cage, it does not mean that. It means your brain and body are making you do something to protect tissue. Everything matters when it comes to pain, just like vision. The brain uses sensory information, a whole lot of stored information, and complex processing of data from everywhere in your life. <coughs> Recovery is possible. They're the key messages that I focused on. We know that understanding your pain is key to recovery. We know that understanding your pain is not necessarily easy, but there are many resources that you can turn to that will help you do that. Medicines and surgeries are often not the answer. I would say on my understanding of the scientific literature, that medicine and surgeries are usually not the answer. Doesn't mean that they're never the answer. They're never involved in the answer. I think they're, they're never the only part of an answer. Sometimes they're a, they're a component. If you wanted to learn more about this, this is the uh, link on Professor Google for the, the flipping pain have I got that link correct? They look right, yeah? Launch today. This, is, this will take you to what we're doing in Australia, painrevolution.org. On our site, there are lots of resources, videos, uh, links to other uh, online things that you can do to learn about the events that we do. But it's a long way for you to come <laughs> to Wangaratta, in country Victoria, uh, I don't expect you to do that. But apparently someone has travelled four hours for this today. And whoever you are, I'd like to congratulate you. That is proactive. Outstanding stuff. That's all from Cormac and I. Uh, what's next? So if I'd remembered to mention at the start, you would all know that what is next is an um, uh, interactive Q&A with a couple of additional special guests that we've got. Um, if we could start with a little ripple for Lorimer and Cormac. Please. A, ripple. a little ripple. Um, if I can just trouble a couple of colleagues to set us up on the stage. Um, while they're doing so, um, just in advance of our additional guests coming up before we do the Q&A stuff, just a couple of things... You can go, guys. Um, a couple of things to bear in mind for this last part of the event. Um, first of all, because we're filming and we need to be able to capture things, um, 
I'll probably do a running around with a microphone. So if you've got a question, if you raise your hand and please wait for me to get to you with a microphone before you ask the question so we can capture it and the rest of the room can hear. Um, the second two points that are very much interrelated but really important are please refrain from asking any questions that are about specific medical conditions, individual circumstances, etc. Um, certainly not because we're not interested, but it would be inappropriate for any of our panel or our guests to try and answer that um, professionally um, in, in, in such a format as today. And I guess related... Okay, guys. <laughs> Closely related to that is please, please bear in mind why we're all here today and why people have given up their time to come and hear about the, su the subject matter of choice. If you've got questions that aren't directly related to our guests or to what, we're listening to, or what we've been listening to today, for example, what services are available near me or where can I learn more, etc., etc. A, it's not why a lot of us are here, but B, the people, on the people here are probably not the best placed. But there are a lot of people around the room, um, a few of them sticking their hands up, who won't be disappearing at the end. So we, we can answer all questions, but if you're going to ask the questions to this panel and in front of everyone, please keep them directly relevant or as close to that as possible to what we're talking about. I got through those three points quicker than you could get some chairs out, didn't I? <laughs> uh, and you guys can jump up and join the panel as well, but it looks like you, well, you've got seats. Cool, do we jump Yeah, out? yeah. Gronje, Fenn. Now, you've, our first two mel panel members have already introduced themselves, but can I ask you three guys to do a, a very brief intro just to our audience as well, and then we'll kick off with the questions. Hi, my name's Gronje. I'm the clinical lead for the community pain service here in Lincolnshire. My background is physiotherapy, and uh, I'm very excited to be here sharing the stage with such illustrious company. I don't think my microphone's working. Can you hear right up the back? No. Okay, you have to yell. Oh, I'm not very good at yelling. Hello. Hello. Oh, here we go. I'm just going to make me work, run further if you oh, right. introduce okay. yourself with a mic and then I'll run the mic out there. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so my name's Gronje. I'm the clinical lead of the uh, community pain service here in Lincolnshire. And my background is a physiotherapist. And I'm very excited to be sharing the stage with such illustrious company on both sides. Hello, my name's Sven Kipley and I'm a Lincolnshire yellow belly and I'm a pain survivor. I'm Carolyn, I live in Skegness and I am a pain survivor. Brilliant, thanks very much guys. Um, so, anybody, any questions for, uh, and you can feel free to direct them to particular people on the panel or just an open question and we'll see who prefers to respond. Is anybody going to go first? Here we go. Hi there. Um, when does pain become discomfort? When, when is that boundary of this, this is painful, I need to you know, deal with it, or it's just a bit uncomfortable? Uh, I, 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 I've, that, that's a lovely question because uh, I feel very comfortable as a scientist saying it depends. <laughs> uh, and probably when it does. Uh, and when it does will be different for everyone in this, in this room. And uh, maybe you could, you could even reword the idea of that question, I think, uh, to go the other way. Say, when do you flip over into pain from something else? And uh, you do when you do, if, that's, if that makes sense. The, and it's so complex biologically and unrepeatable biologically. We do experiments where we will deliver exactly the same stimulus 300 times to one individual and that person within that hour will experience everything from not noticing the stimulus to rating it at 9 out of 10, pulling their hand away, swearing at you. It's the same stimulus but it's that everything else is bubbling away. So my, yeah, my answer as a card-carrying pain scientist is when it does. Could I answer as well? Yeah, yeah I used my phone. Yeah. Um, it's a really important question. Um, I offered, I don't know why, to help a um, student at university who is doing uh, sports science. And of course, we've all got this idea that sports science is, oh yes, you 
huge suspicious. I'm a geographer thinking, oh, he won't know anything. So I go to this session literally two weeks ago for the first time I've been in the gym for five years. I'm walking up to the sports centre and the back of my knee is killing. I've got a baker's cyst, as they call it. Well, they tell me I've got a baker's cyst, I'm not so sure. So I'm thinking, oh God, I hope he's not going to make me do too much because, oh, I'm in pain already. Within 20 minutes of being with the guy, he puts me on a bike, you know, a stationary static bike. And I'm thinking, uh -huh, I hope. 20 minutes later, I've got no pain in my knee. That's a reality. That's what happened. That's what happened two weeks ago. So it is the psychological thing where you think, I can't bend my knee, I can't bend my knee, I can't get on the bike, I can't get on the bike. I got on the bike and I'm going to the gym this week. For me, I think the, the difference is when it stops you from doing something. So if you can go out about your normal business, go for a picnic with the grandchildren or whatever you want to do, or go shopping, then suddenly you can't because you're so frightened of the pain it might cause you. And it can literally happen overnight. One day you can do something and the next day you can't. I think that is when it, became, it becomes a problem because it's so isolating. You think that you're the only one in that pain and nobody else can understand. That is when it becomes a problem. Thanks very much. Any other questions, guys? Um, it's more for the pain survivors, but have you got any tips for making um, other people, particularly younger people, how do you explain to them? Because I have problems explaining to my peers, and I've met so many other people who do, and it's, I think it's hard for other people who don't have chronic pain to understand the concept of it. So have you got any tips or anyone? I asked them, it, when was the last time that they actually felt any pain? whether it was just from a toothache or they fell down the stairs or whatever caused the pain. Ask them to take them back to that moment. How did it make them feel emotionally? And if they were in that situation again, how would they deal with it? And I think by, make, by encouraging somebody to remember an event themselves, take them back to something that they can recall will help them to understand you better. It's to do with empathy. If you can empathise with someone, you're much better, you're much more likely to take on board what they're advising you. If you don't understand what somebody's trying to say to you, you get in nowhere. So, but by sort of encouraging them to think about a situation that you share together that caused pain, you can empathise with them more. Because empathy, it, to me, is one of the most important things in your recovery. And it's not just about, like you said, you need to educate people around you, not just yourself. I think the other important thing is to say that you are not your pain. You have your own identity. I got to the point where I didn't go to social occasions or speak to people and kept myself away. Um, like from family, really important family things, because I didn't have anything to say other than pain, pain, pain. I didn't have anything to discuss other than my clinical appointments or what the outcome of that was. And then I thought about it, thinking, do you know, before I had this pain, I did all these things, you know, I was an adventurer from, from what I call adventuring in Lincolnshire, it's climbing up a steep hill, you know, that's an adventure. Uh, you know, and I used, to, I used to bike 40 miles a weekend. I used to walk for miles. I used to go swimming. I used to take people out in nature. And then I'm thinking, some of those things I can still do. I am not my pain. And I think some of it is, when they say to you, oh, you're looking really well today, I used to go, oh, God, if you've got any idea how much, you know, that I'm swearing in my head and I'm thinking, you know, I need to say thank you. Because they are seeing me as somebody that looks well. And maybe I should start thinking, hey, hang on a minute, I look okay. I'm not presenting all these horrible things that they'd like these, as if demons are eating my soul, because that's what it feels like at times. Um, but yeah, I think Carolyn's right. I think also even it's having that private conversation to say, do you know what? Yeah, I look well. 
I'm trying to get well and it'd be helpful if you could help me get well because I'm trying to do these things and do you know the things that I want to do do you think you could help me with some of them because I really would like to put the washing out do you think you could help me do that I mean I know that sounds really minor but for some people being able to put the washing out is a major achievement sorry great great you want to say that it's okay sorry I was just going to add to that I think it's a really common thing for especially young people with persistent pain to experience because if if you haven't experienced persistent pain um, even for those of us as clinicians who maybe haven't experienced it on a on a regular basis it is hard to know and experience what that is like and then um, I quite often use the analogy for people of um, somebody who is pregnant for the first time and um, telling you all the things that they're going to do whenever, and I was very guilty of that. I had huge plans for what I was going to happen immediately after I had my childbirth. Everybody tried to tell me what it was going to be like having a baby. And I was like, no, it'd be fine. I'll be back at work within a few weeks and then they'll be sleeping through and then I'll be able to do this, that and the other thing. And actually, until I'd experienced that or until, you know, there are just some things that until you've experienced it, it is really hard. To, to get it completely, but I love the idea of trying to get them to think back to an occasion where they've experienced something similar, and that can often be a nice way to just start that conversation, but that doesn't mean it'll always be easy. Yeah, so we're all excited about this one. <laughs> um, uh, for, for what we're trying to do in Australia, and, and I think what's being uh, mirrored here, your, your question actually speaks to uh, your responsibility as an informed person to take on the challenge of uh, helping someone else learn about this scenario. So we've, we've actually put a, a lot of work into what phrases can you use? Uh, and one of the phrases that's worked most well uh, is a response like, so someone says, are you still in pain? Or, or how are you today, or whatever it is, and you're able to say, uh, I have persistent pain because I, my pain system is, is currently overprotective. And that reflects my genes and things that have happened in my body and everything else. It's, it's actually amazing. Do you want to learn more about it? And we try to coach people who are, who are going through the recovery journey of, of having the courage to claim that their system is overprotective. And there is, this is a function of our fearfully and wonderful, wonderfully complex biology. And we can draw other people into helping us. One thing I, I loved about uh, what you said, Carolyn, is uh, that, that empathy. But I think it's really hard to be empathic with someone who's not prepared to own, own it as well. Uh, and I love, I, I, I really love the idea of uh, showing that you, you would like assistance with this journey. If that, if that is someone who's appropriately placed in your life uh, to be assisting you with that journey, uh, that's a great opportunity to do that. So I think we, we I totally endorse the, the, the challenge of communicating because most people will go, what the? But it only takes you, I mean, they're asking about you because they care, and it only takes you to say, my pain system is currently overprotective, and I'm learning about that, and I'm in the process of learning how to retrain it to be less protective. And then we, we encourage it, was put on the end, it's pretty amazing what really happens. Do you want to learn more about that, or would you like me to tell you more about that? And you become, you become the messenger and the, the educator. Uh, but you do need courage and you do need support and you do need the data. But I love the question. Uh, it's my favourite question of 2020. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is a cracking question. Um, and I think it, it typifies exactly what today is all about. Um, going back to what Carolyn mentioned about empathy, empathy, how much empathy a person perceives um, from someone providing their health care is a really strong predictor in terms of recovery. It's one of the strongest predictors there is. So to feel 
empathy, to, to feel that the person understands where you're coming from is hugely important for recovery. And a public health campaign like Flip and Pain works on multiple levels. Yes, it talks to that person in pain and it helps them hopefully to understand their pain a little. But it also talks to their friends, their relatives, so that they can understand the pain a little bit better. And it might just nudge them closer towards a more empathic stance. It's not gonna change anything overnight, but just nudge. And if it can do that, well then I think that's another step closer to managing and recovering from pain really well. Thanks for the question. Brilliant question. Anybody want to try and rival that for a popular question? <laughs> Any more? For, back to the front. I think sometimes when you know somebody who's in pain, um, often they're fearful of seeking help in case it makes their pain worse. Uh, is there any advice that you would give to pass on to the person in pain to help them to just start that journey? You said that the first week of the journey is the hardest, but I imagine even just making the decision to start the journey is you know, way up there. Is there any advice that any one of you would give to help start that off? I'll very briefly try and answer, answer that one. Um, I, I think most um, people I, I, I've encountered in a kind of a one-to-one -one setting who have persistent pain, not most, but many, um, they're almost looking for permission to go and, and do something and get more active. They're concerned that if they do something more active, they will worsen the injury in their body. And it's a perfectly intuitive, sensible way of thinking. But if you began, begin to understand modern pain science, you begin to understand that that rationale doesn't work anymore. And that barrier doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that there aren't other barriers, but that barrier doesn't exist. And it can help you, again, nudge you, give you, allow you to give yourself permission to try some of these things, like trying getting on the bike. It might go your way, it might not, but giving you the permission to try it means that you're more likely to find a successful path. Um, I think it's really difficult because we've got socialised. When we go and seek help with pain or we advise people with pain, we're very submissive because that's the way we've been told to be. When we go see the doctor, we put on this little pain voice. Like, oh, I'm really not feeling very well. And when you go to the doctor, I think the doctor asks you the wrong question. How are you feeling today? He's not listening to you. Maybe we should be feeling empowered to go in and say, do you know what I'd like to achieve? Yes, I've got pain, but do you know what? I'd really like to get back to work or I'd like to do some gardening again or I'd really like to see my friends again. Can you help me? And I think it's not only flipping the pain, but I think it's flipping the conversation as well. And you've got to feel empowered and help anybody who is experiencing pain and scared to do that. Support them through that process. If it means you go into the, to the consultation with them, please go, encourage them, have a chat about it first. Make a list of things that you want out of that consultation, but you own that consultation, that person with pain, you own it. You don't have to be aggressive, just be assertive, and it's a different thing, and it's particularly difficult for women, because when women become assertive, oh, that's an aggressive patient, oh my gosh, I want to share something with you, if you don't mind me taking time, guys. This is a clinician's letter, it looks very familiar, can you see this? This is only from January. I saw somebody I'd never seen before on the 24th of January this year. I get this letter back and I'm going, ah, this isn't me. Who was this? Who was this? And do you know what it says in about it? It's got a sentence that says wear and tear. Now, what did we learn about wear and tear earlier? But the most important thing is, I'll just read this out, excuse me. She is fully aware this will not help her pain or any of her symptoms. We're discussing a biomedical treatment here. And she may not go back to playing golf as she thinks she will. Now, two things here. I never played golf in my life, okay? 
I am of Scottish heritage, but why waste a good walk? And because um, I went in and said, I don't want you to give me something else. I want to get back to work. I would like to go back to work. This guy didn't hear me. This is a waste of paper. This is a waste of his time and my time because he didn't hear me. You've got to own it. Your friend has got to own it. Encourage your friends to own it. If I could just step back a little bit further, my question would be, what if, what if you actually thought about, is there another way? You could write down the pros and cons. What would happen if you didn't do anything? You'd be staying where you are. But what if you actually took action? So once you've sort of, I practice mindfulness, which is living in the now, forgetting what's gone because you can't change it. You don't know what's coming. So all you can think about is how you're feeling now. So I think the timing is one of the things that people will only listen to you if they're ready. But by asking them, this is the question that was asked of me, what if you got in a car and drove yourself to town by yourself? You might have a panic attack, but you might not. So I think if somebody is not willing to make that initial step, and it, all, it is all baby steps, and by making that first step and actually thinking, what if, what if I did go and speak to somebody? What if I picked up a book? What if I listened to something on YouTube about pain? What would happen? They would actually probably start to take some action and that is when you start. Once you make that first step into taking action and doing something for yourself, it's really empowering. You can go, yippee! I did it, I actually, and it doesn't matter how small that move is, it's a movement in the right direction. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've just run short of time, but we might have been a pick stop. Uh, sorry? Half a question? Go on then, I'll allow half a question. I'm interested to see how this is going to go, really. So. <laughs> just, just one for the panel. Um, can we say then, that pain is a function of the, s the environment we're in. So if we're in a, a good environment, then pain is lower than if we're in an environment that might increase that cycle of thinking of pain. Interesting half a question. <laughs> Anyone want to offer half an answer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I would say yes. Uh, that's, I think that's completely true, but not complete. I think that I think it's a bigger story that goes around that. That it's also about our internal environment. But I, I love the the way that environment captures everything in my world at this moment. If the sum total of that is protect, then you'll have pain. If the sum total of that is don't, then you won't. It's, it, in many ways, it's as simple and as difficult as that. Brilliant, thank you very much. Right, uh, not a little ripple this time. Can we have a full on round of applause for these guys and our panel, please? We always do run short of time, so apologies we couldn't fit all of the questions in. Um, a last couple of pleas from me. First of all, um, you will all have feedback forms on your chairs. I know you've already given up a good hour and a half of your time, but the feedback you provide is so important to us to know how we structure these events in the future, what people take from them, what they want to hear more of. So please, please, if, unless you've got to be right out the door, please fill in the feedback forms for us. Um, and related to that, we're mentioning future events. Um, the website was mentioned before. On your chairs in the packs, you will have links to email signups or to a website. The minute it is actually just a holding page, but there's more information to come there. Just to stay abreast of what we're doing in the future. So we have grand plans, including a big tour across Lincolnshire in July, which we'd be delighted to see people sign up for to either support or join the Peloton, join the tour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, please sign up, please get involved again, please tell friends, family members, and thank you very much for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you.